Yeah, so you're talking about the um, we, we're talking about about race and um, its connections, like you said, the you know, and ideas of democracy. I'm just uh, you know, I'm I'm still waiting. I don't I don't know how many years it's been. I'm still waiting for the NRA to stand up for like Philando Castile. Yeah, yeah. For, for well, some I mean, reason, they're not. You know, obviously, I'm being sarcastic, right? I mean, he was licensed gun owner, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, and that's actually not to bring in. Um, another another project right. that's, that's right. actually my project and um well my book policing the second amendment oh wow public law enforcement and the politics of race and that book actually it opens with the case of philando castile oh, and boy. raises the question of you know how is it that you know you have you have this case and the nra is silent and not only that, but this is an opportunity to actually have a different kind of gun debate and we mm. end up not having it really. Right. No, right, um, right, 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 right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so I think there's also, I mean, one of the pieces of that also is the relationship between gun rights, um, the NRA and public law enforcement. And so, mm. you know, it wasn't just that. And, and I mean, I should say it wasn't just because these actually are, are intertwined. It was both, you know, the racial politics of what happened intertwined with the fact that it was um, basically a case that would compel the NRA to, to stand up to and criticize the police. And I think mm. that, you know, on both of those counts, the NRA was, you know, unwilling yeah. to basically do anything other than issue the vaguest of statements. And it created, um, you know, there was, there was backlash within NRA membership, basically saying, what are we doing if, if the NRA isn't making a, a statement about this case? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have these, um, yeah, you have these moments and you, you kind of can see like a little crack, um, and then it gets filled in. Right. Right. And that's yeah, definitely, definitely the case. But yeah, I mean, so there's the politics of race. And I think that, you know, tracing out the politics of race, tracing out the politics of difference, you know, it's it's both kind of seeing, seeing that and how it unfolds um, in sort of explicit ways. But then there's also these more subtle ways that, um, you know, difference and sort of the, the boundaries of who's in and out of gun culture get negotiated. Yeah. And one of the ways that was very apparent and even more apparent than when I did my research in 2010 with gun carriers and gun instructors was um, how what was partisanship, right? And, mm. you know, liberals with guns. And so, you know, there was a lot of fanfare about, you know, we embrace diversity, we embrace, you know, women with guns, sexualized minorities with guns, racialized mm. minorities with guns. Um, but it all stopped when it got to the question of liberals. And that mm. was um, that was actually very interesting because there was kind of this split uh, among, um, you know, the gun sellers that identified to the right or on the conservative side, you know, either, you know, this is a moment for liberals to wake up and finally, you know, and and I, I um, yeah, there's this kind of conservative um uh, slogan awake but not woke and I think mm. that's what they were they were trying to get at um and then there was the sort of like these people are lost causes like there's yeah. no for them you know that sort of thing um and so you know definitely and you can see this in pro-gun media you can you know read about it in in my book with my my conversations with gun sellers um that was really um you know this this kind of line in the sand in terms of mm -hmm. um, you know who was in or out um and I think that's where as more liberals are buying guns, that's where the interesting movement I think is going to happen. Are they going to, you know, jump onto the, you know, what has historically, well, historically since the 1970s been an increasingly conservative gun politics and gun culture, or are we going to see some really um, interesting divergences in terms of, you know, what gun, gun culture means in the U.S.? Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, so, I mean, backing up a little bit, the it, what's described in the book is the tw 2020, they give the term the great run on guns. Mm -hmm. You talked about all the new gun owners, um, 8.4 million, you, uh, you wrote new gun owners. Yeah. Um, estimates. Yeah. Estimate, yeah. Right. Can never be yeah. exact. And some somewhere around 23 million guns just in that year alone bought. Um, mm -hmm. This quote was really interesting. Gun sellers are merchants, not just of guns, but also of conservative gun culture. Mm -hmm. And just what you're saying now kind of makes me think of it in a different way. I think of it as like, I think of it like patronizing in its truest sense, right? Like as in like gun sellers kind of like picking who's cool, you know, who's in the cool club. Right. And so it's like, they're not just merchants. They're like, they're deciders, right? They're deciders of who gets included. So I mm -hmm. thought that was really, really interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, it was just, yeah, just to jump in. I mean, it was interesting to hear. So, so one of the paradoxes of, 
American gun law is that the very people who enforce gun laws are gun sellers, right? The people who are most invested in, in gun rights. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really interesting to hear gun sellers talk about how they like use gun laws and how they talk about gun laws right, even right. they're enforcing them. So one of the one of the things that often came up was, you know, gun sellers having to basically deal with clientele who didn't understand gun law because actually gun law is very complicated. It varies from state to state. There's a whole lot of yeah, it's it's complicated. And so, you know, hearing them describe them having to explain to, you know, mm -hmm. new gun buyers like this is what a waiting period is. This is what you have to do. Yes, you can buy a gun on the internet, but I you can't actually get it shipped to you directly from the internet. And so, you know, they saw this as an opportunity to basically school these these new gun buyers mm -hmm. in, you know, what I what I, what I was calling at one point in the book, you know, really existing gun control. So like you know, their their whole joke was like, isn't gun control great when people are desperate, you know, these people who are desperate to to get guns who um who've, who've never owned guns before. And so yeah, it was really interesting to see just how um even even the very laws that are passed um you know to to restrict and regulate were mm -hmm. used as um sort of like teachable moments yes. by um by gun sellers. Yeah, I, I mean, I could I could almost hear like the smugness or the kind of laugh, you know, the sarcasm, like in as the, the sellers were describing kind of like, well, you know, you you thought you could get it right away, but you can't. You got to have this called a waiting period and just. Yeah, again, one of my favorite one of my favorite quotes was a gun seller who was um, and this was right after a big uh, scandal involving college admissions had just mm -hmm. happened or just had been publicized and. Um, yeah, he said, you know, he was like, yeah, people are like, well, what if I pay you more? What if I do? And he was like, uh, this isn't college admissions, which I think is interesting ooh. because it's both a, we follow the law, we are not playing elitist games, and this is what you voted for because- yeah. This is this is what gun control looks like. You know, I mean, like, so all those all those messages are all packed into that that, mm -hmm. that simple little snide joke. And so right. yeah, it's yeah. Right. Well, yeah. So, you, I mean, you, you, the book is broken down into four chapters with a conclusion. You, you kind of talked a lot, you know, just about, you know, armed individualism and this idea that, you know, we need to protect ourselves, freedom in fear, freedom from fear. Uh, you talked about the more diversity. And one thing I thought was very interesting about the book is the, the distinction you make between like, so this goes into the second chapter, which is conspiracism and this idea of like experience versus expertise. Mm -hmm. And I am so interested in this idea of you know like the death of humility right like you know people i mean just off the top it's like okay what does anthony fauci know wait mm -hmm. he's been doing things since the time of aids and the eight you know i mean what does he know like he's you know got whatever i'm exaggerating he's got nine phds and this and that but you really make the point that it's like and with those in, individual interview individual interviews it's like okay but i have the experience says the guy mm -hmm. i have the experience and for them that's equal to or better than expertise yeah, I mean, it's right. it's interesting because it's, yeah, it's, it's a sense of, you know, I know everybody is saying this, or I know, and some of it is not just everybody, it's elite liberal media. Right, exactly. And team with, yeah. sorry, team with the elites of, of science as well, right? So, yeah, so it's government, yeah. Elite media elites and science science elites. elites so right. you know all elitism in all of its different <laughs> in its different realms sure. um, you know and that stacking up to immediate experience you know like i know the statistics but in my community it's just not been that way mm -hmm. and so i think it's um yeah it's this very like experience oriented way of um of of ascertaining reality, ascertaining, um, you know, what's true and what's not. Um, I think it's, it's really interesting that it's not, so it's, it's, con it's conspiracism. Like I talk about conspiracism as, you know, that, that, you know, there's, there's elites and this idea that like, this is, there's some kind of opportunism or something happening behind yeah. the scenes. But mm -hmm. what was interesting about this moment, and I think this characterizes, um, you know, conservative thinking more broadly. Um, and I, I also want to say that it's not the case that conservatives are the only conspiracists like no, no, liberals no. and leftists like there's conspiracy all over the place um you know in the u.s and beyond so you know it's not the case it's really like this is how this coheres on the right um but what's interesting about how it coheres on the right is that it's it's less about you know 
figuring out the answer to this, this riddle of, of public scandal. Like it's not about figuring out who was actually behind the assassination of JFK or something mm -hmm. like that. Right. It's, it's really just like skepticism for skepticism's sake, although it's more com it's, it's more impactful for, than that because it's not simply, you know, it's not simply saying like, I don't know, or I have to know this answer. It's saying, I don't know. And by virtue of recognizing that I don't know, that I'm the ultimate skeptic, that I'm not going to believe right. the experts. I'm not going to just, you know, swallow whatever somebody's trying to shove down my throat. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually asserting myself as an individual, you know? And I think mm -hmm. in this context where we have, you know, social media, we have, you know, cable news networks, we have a, a, lots silos. Of a lot of silos, right? Yeah, silos, but lots and lots and lots of mm -hmm. um, people who are parading as experts, and also, yep. yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 a very chaotic information landscape, and so you can like in that context, kind of doubling back on like, okay, this is this is how I can I can assert myself as an individual knower in this context. I think is that's the work that conspiracism is doing more so mm -hmm. than saying like, you know, I know who's behind 9-11 or I know who's behind yeah. JFK's assassination or what have you. Yeah, so yeah. it was definitely, um, yeah, it was really, um, and yeah. And, and part of sort of making that argument is also trying to, trying to shift the conversation about conspiracism away from sort of the, extremist uh sort of mm -hmm. manifestations of it and yeah QAnon or you know th th that kind of thing to like no this is actually like a sense-making tactic that isn't fringe it's actually really central to right. how democracy is put together by virtue of the fact that there's always going to be a gap between the experts and mm -hmm. the everyday people between folk knowledge and expert knowledge and you know in a hyper you know in a social media world in a hy hyper um uh, you know, in, in such a chaotic information environment, um, that's going to be stressed even more. So mm. I think that's where, um, you know, part of the book is to to d give a snapshot and to really try and understand um, by, by virtue of having this kind of snapshot of 2020, like this is how this stuff makes sense on the ground. Like we can talk about Trump, we can talk about the Republican Party, but, you know, how does this actually work out on the ground and how does it make sense to, you know, the people who are um, finding it useful and, and, and sensible? Yeah, you make it very clear in the book that it's, you know, it's you're really studying the bottom up, not the top down, which is a very interesting and um, enlightening, you know, distinction. You talk about how there's a gap. I mean, you know, that's a very real gap between we call them the elites, the government, whatever. But it's like, so you write about how to fill in that gap. There's the idea of, you know, doing your own research. There's a lot of mm -hmm. comics and stuff like that, you know, about the person who did his own research for COVID. And that's not something I'm going to celebrate, but, you know, got sick or died. I still, mm -hmm. I will never, ever, ever, you you mentioned the book. I will never understand like the story of like Herm Cain. Mm -hmm. After he died, his Twitter, his Twitter account was still posting about anti-mask. And I'm just like, what, for what? His life over, you know, going to see Trump talk about, about windmills for anyways. Oh my gosh. But you know, the idea of doing your own research, right? And so you make the really good point. It's like, okay, if, if so-and-so's doing his own research, well, I know that some, in some way that, you know, BLM, Black Lives Matter, you know, they're paid actors and mm -hmm. that can really just kind of gloss over, right? They're very real concerns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like about racism, about systemic racism. I don't know if it was an actual quote, but one of the subheadings was, I'm not an expert, but I'm a thinker. And I feel like that sums up so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's actually a quote by, um, that's actually a quote from a book by um, uh, Reese Peck, who writes yeah. about Fox News and um, very much uh, finds a very similar way of sort of um, well, it's a, a, an epistemology, if I can use like a, sure, <laughs> a sure, sure. epistemology word, you know, a, a way of, um, yeah, in, engaging in knowledge, in knowledge making um, practices. Yeah, mm. that was really jargony. I know that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. The, so, you know, the third chapter is partisanship, which, you know, we've talked about a, a good amount. Um, it was kind of a, not a footnote, but it wasn't a huge part. But I thought this was so interesting where you make the connection. I think I, I don't I hope I'm not misreading it, but between like, okay, partisanship, you know, us versus them. And you make the distinction about like how, you know, a lot of Protestant Christianity, not all, is very literal in the Bible mm. and, and how that, you know, how that can work for for politics too, right? It's, I mean, think yeah. about all, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene and all these folks about what they use for like, you know, 
the dark side and it's a battle versus good versus evil. And it just makes so much sense. If, if the Bible is literal, then, you know, there is a, there are yeah. demonic forces, right? Yeah. Um, so I have to actually, I have to actually tip my cap to um, Francesca Tripodi, who actually mm -hmm. is um, someone who, so, so she really gets the the credit for, for a lot of those insights. Um, I cite her a lot in the book yeah. um, because she's really worked through how sort of, um, you know, scripturalism and sort of these, these ways, I mean, we could call them religious practices, but they're not, they can be secularized. And so, yeah. you know, not just in terms of, um, I, I, yeah, what you were getting at with, you know, this idea that there's this like demonic threat that is not mm -hmm. external. It's, it's not terrorism. It's, it's internal. It's, it's, it's something that is, um, you know, an evil lurking within, um, you know, that's, that's definitely, um, you know, is, is, echoing religion, even if it's um, a religi religiosity, even if it's it's a secularized way of, of expressing that. Uh, but one of the other things that she talks about, and this goes back to conspiracism, is, you know, this relationship to the text and the idea that, like, you should be able to read the, and it's Protestantism, right? It's like, you should mm. be able to read the Bible. You should have a direct, you know, a, a direct relationship uh, with God. And, right. and, and, you know, we see that sort of idea about having sort of direct access to not you know to to mm -hmm. expertise to being able to you know do your own research and that sort of thing and so you know in in many ways you can kind of trace out um the impact of not so much like religious beliefs but like religious style religious practices um mm -hmm. in terms of how these things are fit together so it's really it's really, really fascinating, but I can't yeah, take that because that's, that's actually, um, yeah, that's, that's Francesca's work. I appreciate that. You know, so, yo, if, if it is about sorting life into opposing camps, um, you know, both sides, if we're, if we're talking, if we're making it a binary, so obviously there are a lot of in-betweens, but, you know, ideas of like, well, both sides are going to say, well, you know, the liberals, they don't look at real science. Mm -hmm. You don't look at real science, right? They just listen to the, the you know, the Fauci's, they don't, you know, yeah. and the, uh, you know, liberals would say the same of conservatives or right-leaning people, right? And yeah. this idea, you, you quote the, the survey about 79% of Democrats, this was a couple of years ago, said something that the effect that they had cold or very cold feelings towards Republicans and 83% of Republicans toward Democrats. I want to say the percentage is 17, 18%, something about like the mm -hmm. percentage of liberals who are kind of just like, why don't they just die off? Yeah, yeah. Right. And that I mean that's pretty pretty sobering, yeah. Yeah, I mean I I think it's sobering not just that the you know it's it's a we could say like oh it's a minority of people thinking that but like that's a huge chunk of people who are like yeah if half the population just died off like whatever. Right? Um that's really disturbing and it's I mean it's not even the finding itself it's the fact that that was even a sensible question for mm. a researcher. I mean it's great research, it's great to know but like yeah. we live in a world where that's a that is a legitimate research question. Yeah. How much do we hate each other that we're willing to tolerate the suffering and the pain mm. of the other side? I mean, that's just really profound. It so is. absolutely. And it is, you know, it's, it's tricky because, you know, especially when you're thinking about this as, you know, sociologists should, which is, you know, my job here is to really make sense of the social world. And so, you know, just kind of pointing all these things out, I'm focusing on conservatives, I'm focusing on gun sellers, mm -hmm. but I try throughout the book to remind when, when it's true, you know, Hey, this is also happening. You know, this is also happening on the left. And that's also a conversation that, that we need to be having. Um, and I think that that's where, if, if I can just move to the, the last um, empirical chapter of the book, yeah. that's where I think, um, you know, we get some of the answers to like, what do we do? Um, so I, I talked to gun sellers, the vast majority of them were conservative, but I had a handful of gun sellers that identified as progressive, liberal, Democrat, uh, which was super interesting to talk to them. And as you might not be surprised to hear, they had very different views than um, other gun sellers. Uh, they were very much embracive of armed individualism. They were absolutely, you know, proponents of gun rights. So that wasn't the difference, but they had a much different take on partisanship, on conspiracism. They were open to listening to the experts. Um, they were also, you know, as, you um, proponents of gun rights, they had a lot of criticism of, you know, government action. And I think that's, I mean, 
most Americans do. I think that's something that is is a very American thing to be critical of government, um, whether you're on the left or the right. And so that was definitely the case for them. But they also could see spaces where government action or collective action was appropriate. They didn't write it off, you know, out of hand. Yeah. So they were critical, but not um, sort of dogmatic with it. Um, and then I think the other thing that really distinguished them was that they were willing to accept that they that their experience was not sort of the be all end all of reality. And so this particularly to go back to the question of race, um, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book is that, you know, because gun sellers were often, you know, understanding their reality so much as intertwined with their direct experiences, they were baffled by Black Lives Matter, by the defund the police movement. Um, it, there was no connection that they were able to make with regard to their their individual experiences. And, um, you know, that wasn't entirely completely true across the board. There are, um, you know, major critiques in certain, you know, niches of the the gun rights community with regard to police but you know by and large it was experienced as as, as like frankly foreign in terms of their direct experiences and it's not that the um the sort of left leaning or liberal gun sellers were like somehow had some different experience and they were able to connect to that in a different way it was that they basically said look i know i don't understand this like i know that i have not live this life and walked in those shoes. And so who am I, basically, who am I to judge? So it wasn't a like, I agree with this platform, I agree with that pl platform. It was this sort of humility of, you know, who am I to judge? I don't actually know their reality. And I think that is, and, and by the way, I want to make super clear, I don't think it's because these people were liberal or leftist or dead. Like, I don't think like liberals have this amazing innate empathy that conservatives constitutively <laughs> lack. I don't think sure. that's what going on. I think it was that they were liberals in a conservative context. They were mm -hmm. liberals in a conservative environment. And so that forced them to make bridges that people whose politics match the environment that they were in didn't have to do. And so I kind of end the book with saying, you know, look, if we want to think about how to rehabilitate our culture of democracy in the United States, it's actually the people that are, it's not the people on one side versus the other, it's the people who are crossing divides, people who are bridging, maybe it's the liberal gun owner, it's the people who are buying guns for the first time. Those are the people that may actually be in the place to imagine, you know, the kinds of practices and tools we'll need to, to rehabilitate the culture of democracy in the US. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's such a cliche, but it's like, I mean, unfortunately, gun culture is so, is just like, uh, you know, it's American as apple pie. And, um, but there's so much in this book that's so interesting. You, you write about how, not necessarily, right? I mean, 50s and 60s, especially the NRA, you know, this idea of gun culture becoming politicized when it has, hasn't, hasn't always been. And not in a, in a Mickey Mouse cheesy way, you know, kumbaya way. Um, that last chapter, you know, really does give a call to action or sort of, you know, remedies, if you will, civic grace, et cetera. And, you know, the last chapter really talks about how, that the bridges the bridges can be built and I, you know that's the one that's, that's very personal and you know just appreciate you as a writer sharing that um, those personal stories about you and your father and just as a person sharing your your thoughts with me today and, and with our listeners um like i said people will be listening to this may 2nd may 3rd congrats i'm seeing in the future here a little bit the the book is out in the world and i wish i wish i wish i wish it was not so topical and so you know right on but unfortunately it is so congratulations on the impending book and, and thanks again so much for your time. Thank you so much. Pleasure.